So one useful diagram that people often use to uh, characterize different translation systems is called the translation pyramid, and it looks like the following. So I have English over here. Let's say I'm trying to translate into French over here. So in direct translate systems, we sort of directly translate from the English to French, so we just draw an arrow here. In transfer-based systems, we do the following. We do some analysis. So schematically, we get to some point a little bit further up the pyramid. And then we have a transfer stage. And so this is the English pause tree, for example. This is the French pause tree. And then finally, we have a generation stage. And the intuition behind the pyramid is that if you do a bit of analysis, then you have less far to go in this transfer stage. You've made, th you made your uh, transfer problem a lot easier than in the purely direct case. And of course, there might be various levels of analysis, so we might have some method of going a bit higher up the pyramid, in which case it becomes even easier to translate. Um, of course, it may be harder to form a deeper analysis, so there's some trade-off there. Now, the final type of translation system takes this idea to the extreme. This is what's called interlingua-based translation. And in this case, there are just two phases. So in the first step, in the analysis step, we're going to analyze the source language sentence into what we hope is a language-independent representation of its meaning. So we actually think of some point at the apex of this pyramid as being a language-independent representation of meaning. So we actually, the analysis step, we go all the way up to this language independent representation. And then secondly, in the generation step, we take this language independent representation and generate the foreign language. Okay, And the, critically, this is going to depend on some definition of interlingua, which is some representation of the meaning of languages, which is independent of language. There are some potential advantages of this method. So one is the following. Um, in a transfer-based system, let's say we have n different languages, say n equals 10 or n equals 100, and we want to build translation systems between all these different pairs of languages. So in transfer-based systems, for every different pair of languages, we're going to have to build a different transfer lexicon. So we're going to have to rebuild the transfer component of the system. So in this case, n squared is approximately equal to 100. In this squared, uh, this case, n squared is approximately equal to 10,000. Okay, so that's a lot of work building the different uh, transfer components for the different language pairs. Um, the appealing thing with a an interlingua-based system is that we just need to build n analysis components. So for each of the n languages, we have to build a component which takes it, say English, and resolves it to some language independent representation. And we need n generation components. So remember the generation component would take the language independent representation and generate, say, a French string or an English string. Okay, So because we've done away with the transfer component, uh, in theory, we just need these n analysis components and these n generation components. So that could be a saving. The downside to interlingua-based approaches is really it is very, very difficult to come up with a truly language independent representation of meaning. It might even from a philosophical point of view be an impossible problem. Here's one example of why it is difficult. How do we represent different concepts in an interlingua? So different languages tend to break down concepts in the world in quite different ways. So let me give you some examples. In English we have a single word for wall, but in German there are actually two words for wall. One for a wall that is internal to a house, so this is a wall which is within a house, and one for an external wall, wall on the outside of a house. So two different words, two different concepts. Uh, Japanese has two words for brother. It has one word for an elder brother and one word for a younger brother. 
Um, Spanish has two words for the English word leg. You use one word for a leg of a human and another word for the leg of an animal or the leg of a piece of furniture, of a table, for example. And as you go through language by language, you find that each language has its own way of breaking up the world into different concepts. If you're not careful, the interlingua is simply going to be an intersection of, the ways of, of these different ways of breaking things down. Uh, or put another way, it's very difficult to um, imagine a priori all the way, different ways you could break down concepts in the world. Every time you add a new language to your translation system, the chances are you will be surprised to find some distinction made in that language, but which you hadn't thought of when you were designing the interlingua. So, bottom line is, designing an interlingua might be, might be a very, very difficult task because of these kind of conceptual problems.